I'll ask you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17, you can remain standing, just have a few verses to read here tonight. Exodus chapter 17. In the beginning of Exodus chapter 17, last week, uh, we saw that Israel was in Rephidim, the place of rest, and yet it was a place without water. But God miraculously provided for them as Moses struck the rock, and out of that rock came streams of living water that were gushing forth to provide them what they needed. And I'm so thankful that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who was that rock. He was struck. Instead of God striking the children of Israel for their complaints and their lack of faith, instead he struck a rock and graciously provided for them. And I'm so thankful that God deals graciously with us. When we voice our complaints, when we have tremendous lack of faith, that he is patient, he is kind and gracious to us and helps us grow, increases our faith in him. And so we're going to read tonight verse number eight through the end of the chapter of Exodus chapter 17. So let's look together at verse number eight. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let, his hand, let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar. He called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. When you look at where it says, because the Lord hath sworn, the original language communicates that one of two things, and, and this is the reason why it's translated, the Lord hath sworn. It's kind of challenging to decipher which meaning it has, but the idea is either that Amalek put his hand on God's throne that doesn't sound good. <laughs> Amalek said, I'm going to be king. You know, I, I imagine somebody going up the steps to the throne and putting their hand on it like they're about to sit down and be king. And God says, no, that's not happening. Uh, or it's possible that it means that God put his hand on his throne like an oath and said, I'm going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And so that's what it says there, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The title of our message tonight is this, The Rallying Point for Battling Believers. So may God bless reading his word. You can be seated. We'll get into our text tonight. <clears throat> During the American War for Independence, there were a number of flags that were circulating around the continental army as they fought the British up and down the eastern seaboard. And one of the more recognizable flags to us in particular is this one called the Gadsden flag. And now the Gadsden flag, you probably recognize those words, don't tread on me. And I did a little bit of uh, research on what this was about. And, and basically this flag was first uh, flown by the commanding ship of the Continental Navy that as the British were approaching, this would be the first flag that they see. And it was meant to communicate this. Don't tread on our independent rights of, of the colonies. And, and but what, as you look this up, you realize that this flag that was designed by uh, the Brigadier General Christopher Gadsden, it was inspired 
by this one. If you've seen this before, join or die. You'll notice that there is a snake there that's divided into several parts. They have abbreviations there for the specific colonies. You've got New England that was all grouped together, New York, New Jersey, uh, Virginia, Maryland, and so you, North Carolina, South Carolina. The idea was this. This was designed, it was, a, it was actually a cartoon put out by Benjamin Franklin during the French and Indian War that as the British colonies there were uh, battling against the French, that they had teamed up with uh, their native allies, and then the French had teamed up with their native allies, and so they were uh, at war together. And what Benjamin Franklin designed this cartoon to communicate was this. If we will all unite together, we'll win this war. But if we're divided, we're going to fall. And so he said, really, this wasn't a threat, join or die. It was this, if we don't join together in this conflict, we will die divided from this conflict. Well, those colonies joined together in the French and Indian War, and they fought that war, and they won against the French. And so with that in mind, Gadsden uh, put this flag together. Because remember, the British were fighting alongside the Americans in the French and Indian War, and they would remember the resolve as these colonies banded together and fought and prevailed in that war. And so when the British ships approached the eastern seaboard and they would see this flag, it was meant by Gadsden to communicate, we're together. And you remember, if we're together, we will prevail. And so when you consider what a flag really is, it's, it's a rallying point. It's something that people can unite under. It's something that gives them power and resolve. And, and what it is, is they're uniting together to say, we are uniting under this power and we will have strength to prevail. It was a rallying point. Everybody looked to that flag as a symbol of strength. Well, Israel is facing their first hand-to-hand -hand combat as a nation that they have uh, been in this place called Rephidim and, and they have to fight against the enemy forces of Amalek. And instead of going into the battle, Moses instead sends Joshua into the battle. And he says, and I'm going to go up into the mountain with the rod of God in my hand. Now the rod of God has become a symbol of power. I've got a rod here. It would have been honestly something like this. Very large, very powerful, very sturdy. And as they have considered this rod, this goes back to Moses' time in the wilderness, that as he's out in the wilderness, God tells him, I want you to throw your rod down on the ground. And he throws his rod on the ground and it becomes a snake. And so then he tells him, I mean, you think about the journey this rod has been through for Israel. That, that in fact, the, the rod of God specifically is mentioned 22 times in the book of Exodus. This is the final time. What that means is all the action with this rod has already taken place in their nation. You think about it, that, that with the rod, Moses smote the waters. They turned into blood back in Egypt. He stretched out his rod toward the heaven and the thunder and the hail fell. He smote the dust and the lice came up. He stretched it out over the water and the frogs came up. He stretched it out toward the desert and the locusts came. And of course, as they were standing at the Red Sea, he held it out over the waters and the waters parted. They went through. And then on the other side of the Red Sea, he let the rod of God down and the waters fell and destroyed their enemy, the Egyptian army. And then just in this chapter, he's in Rephidim. They're without any water. And he takes that rod and poof, hits that rock and it splits in two and out comes the water. That rod has been a symbol of God's power for their nation. And he says, I'm going to take the rod of God up into the hill and I'm going to hold it up and you're going to fight. And, and the Bible says, as he held that rod up, Israel prevailed when he got tired 
and had to let the rod down, Amalek prevailed. And what that did is it showed Israel, when you're under God's power, you're going to prevail. But when you're not under God's power, you're going to fail. And he's, tell, he's telling them, you need to rally under God's power. Because they end up winning the victory. And he builds an altar, Moses does. And he calls the name of that altar, Jehovah Nissi. That means this, the Lord, our banner. The Lord, our banner. Our ensign, our standard, our flag, our rallying point. And so you get the picture there as he's holding that up and the people look up to the hill. They say, hey, God's power's with us. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep going. And so what God is trying to get across to them uh, through this battle is that they need to battle under God's power. Now we may not face physical battles. We may not face military campaigns but we do face some spiritual battles in our lives. We have an enemy called sin that fights us every single day. We have an enemy in Satan who walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. But perhaps the greatest enemy is the one within us. We still have a sinful nature, a sinful flesh that wants its own way. It wants to go its own direction. It wants its vice. It craves its power. It craves its greed and all of those things that would deter us from following God. Our flesh fights us, resists us. And oftentimes, here's what we find. We fail in the battle. We lay down our arms and give in. But I want you to know that you serve a powerful God. And we have a powerful Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ who is perfectly capable of giving you the victory over any spiritual battle that you face. Whether it's a battle at home in your marriage or with your kids or if it's a battle with lust or a battle with anger or if it's a battle with people at work. I mean, whatever battle you may face, he is of sufficient power to give you the victory. And so you know what we need to do? We need to rally under his power. We need to battle with his power on our side. Why do we need to rally together under the power of God in every battle that we face? Well, the first thing that I want you to see is this, that sometimes God calls us to fight our battles. See, what happens is there are times when God has fought for Israel but this is a time when he's going to fight with Israel. If you look at verse number eight, it says, then came Amalek and fought with Israel. You get that, then came Amalek, and you almost get this feeling of a dun, dun, dun. <laughs> you know, like you're camping up in the wilderness, and it's nice and peaceful up there in the mountains, not this time of year, but in the summer, and it's nice and cool, and you're hearing the rushing of the river, and, and, and you're enjoying the peace and quiet. There's no car sounds. There's no uh, horns honking or anything like that, and it's just peaceful as it can be. Then came the bear. You know, that's kind of the feeling that you get here. Well, the reality is, look at this. It says, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Rephidim. You remember what that means? Resting places. God had led them specifically to this exact location because according to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 18, because they were faint and weary, the wilderness, the desert, the sun, it was all taking its toll on them and they needed some time to rest. But oh, how quickly a place of rest became a place of battle. Can I just tell you that a lot of times in your life, resting places can soon become battlefields. That your home can become like a war zone between a husband and a wife. Or it can become like a battlefield between parents and, and, and kids. The bed that you sleep on can become a tremendous battlefield of lust. 
That whatever you face, the couch, of, the couch where you rest can quickly become a war zone of alcohol and drugs. Why? Because here's how it works. The enemy fights us when we're faint and when we're weary and when we're in places of rest. Amalek comes and fights with them. And Deuteronomy chapter 25 tells us that, that when they came to fight, they attacked the feeblest and weakest among them. They came from behind and went after the women and the children and the elderly and the, and the broken and wounded ones. That, that's who they attacked. But instead of God fighting this battle for them, Moses orders Joshua to organize a militia. It says in verse nine, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. See, this isn't like the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, Moses stood there with the rod of God in his hand and he told them as they were saying, we're gonna die, you let us out here just for Egypt to kill us out here. It was better back in Egypt. And he holds out his rod and he says, stand still, keep silent and see the salvation of the Lord. And they watched there as the water split in two and they walked through on dry ground. And when they came out on the other side, they saw Moses stretch that rod out over there and they saw the waves fall and crash on the fiercest army in the face of the world, destroyed their enemy. God fought for them while they didn't even lift a finger. They just watched, but not this time. Instead of fighting for them, this time God decides to fight with them. Moses tells Joshua, you need to go and you must fight in this battle. See, sometimes God fights our battles for us, but then other times he chooses to fight our battles with us. But he calls us to fight, to be engaged in those spiritual battles. Hey, listen, if you're facing spiritual battles at home, in your marriage, you can't just sit idly by and let that thing fall apart. You've got to fight for that marriage. You, you, you've got to do everything that you can to ensure that marriage stays together. You can't get lazy and, and be content to just get lost in some game or some TV show or, or scrolling through your phone on social media where you're sitting there on the couch and yet you don't talk to each other and you're becoming extremely distant from each other. And then there's frustrations that come in that marriage and, and you don't feel like you're as close as you used to be and before you know it, things are falling apart. No, God says you need to fight for that marriage. You need to be engaged in that battle. A lot of times as, as parents, we've got to be careful that we are engaged in this battle, that we are fending off the attacks that come against our children. We can't just let Disney and Hollywood raise our kids to where they sit in front of a TV screen and, and in front of iPads and all those things, just watching video after video after video, because all of those videos are satanically influenced to shape the minds of young children. I mean, just go on Disney Plus now and see what kind of things that they're releasing on there. No, it's all driven to change their thinking, to turn them away from their parents, to make them think that their parents are foolish. And as a parent, I can't stand idly by and just let that happen in my children's lives. No, as a parent, I gotta be engaged in it. I've gotta fight with it. We can't leave them to indoctrination institutes that wanna help change their identity and change their belief system and make them think God doesn't exist and make them think they're not really who they were created to be. No, as a parent, it's my responsibility. It's my calling from God to fight in that battle. You, you, you've got to be engaged in the battle with lust. You can't just let that battle run you over. You can't just let that enemy come and own you. See, the, the reality is, is big business understands how all this works and they understand how to catch your eye. I mean, it can be something that is as simple as toothpaste. You need this crest or this Colgate toothpaste and yet they know what meets the man's eye and so they advertise it with a woman in her night clothes. Why? because they know you're gonna click on that. And then you know what Google does? They tap into your data trail and they begin to funnel things your way because they think that's what you like. No, men, we gotta take action and make sure that we're not just allowing things to come through our eye gate and make sure we're not clicking on things and looking at things that are just gonna send waves of attack after attack after attack in your life. No, you gotta be engaged in that battle. 
got to be. The same thing could be said, whether we're talking about drugs or we're talking about alcohol. or You, you, you can't just put yourself in positions where your friends are going to get you back into it again. You can't put yourself in a position where it's going to be very easy. I mean, let me just tell you this. If you struggle with alcohol, a place of the bar is probably not the best place to hang out. <laughs> Why? Because that's going to send you right back into the pits again. If you've got a friend who got you on drugs and they come knocking on your door, that's probably not the person to invite into your house. No, you, but that's not kind. You got to engage in this battle, my friend, or else it'll run you over. We can't afford to sit idly by. And, 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 and not just can we not afford it, God commands us as his people to be engaged. You might just say, God, why aren't you taking away this addiction in my life? And you're hanging out with the people that got you into it in the first place? God's not going to fight every battle for you, but he will fight every battle with you. But here's what we're going to realize. As we try to fight our battles, we're not good enough on our own. <laughs> that every single time we try to fight a battle in the strength of our own power, our power often fails. Israel could not win this particular battle on their own. Moses says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the rod of God in verse uh, number nine. Tomorrow, I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hands. Joshua goes out and gets his militia and, he, and, and Moses heads up to the top of this hill with Aaron and her. And, and what it says is that he would begin to hold it up with one hand. And as he held it up with one hand, as long as that hand was up, Israel prevailed. But this gets kind of heavy. And so he would switch hands and he would hold it up. And when it was up in the air, high above the people, Israel prevailed. But when he got tired and he had to take a break, let's think about it. Moses is about 78 years old right now. <laughs> Put yourself in issue. He just did this hike all the way up this hill. And now he's trying to, it, with his feeble shoulders and everything, trying to hold this thing up like that. He's got to take a break. But every time he took a break, Amalek would come right back at him. And Amalek would prevail. What that did is it showed Israel, if you don't have the power of God over your life, you're not going to prevail there's not enough strength on your own to win this battle. And the reality is in our lives that we can't fight battles in the strength of our own flesh. I mean, could you imagine uh, with me if modern day Israel charges into Gaza to fight Hamas with squirt guns and water balloons? That would not go over very well. Well, listen, that's what it's like when you're trying to fight battles on your own. Notice the text doesn't say anything about the weapons. It doesn't say anything about the strategy. It doesn't say anything about their actual warfare. All it tells us is when the rod was up, they prevailed. And when the rod was down, they failed. And that, that's designed to show us that human power and human weaponry and human strategy alone is not enough to win these spiritual battles in our lives. They, you, you may think that as a husband, well, I'm the husband, bless God, and if I ramrod my way and steamroll my way in this decision, then, then she'll, she has to do what I say. And she may oblige out of fear, but instead of resolving the conflict, what you've only done is rather deepened it. You've deepened it. See, when it comes to kids in this day and age, we could take our kids out of school and homeschool them, and we could teach them ourselves and get them out of that environment, and we could put parental controls on the, the TV and, and codes and all of that stuff. You can put all this human strategy to work, but if that's all you're depending on, it's not going to do anything to help change those kids' lives. It's a losing battle. And if you're, if you're dealing with, uh, with lust, you could try to, uh, to put in some, some uh, content uh, protection to where you have an accountability partner. Maybe it blocks out websites and blocks out uh, images and you got somebody there keeping you accountable. And let me just say that's a great start. But if that's all you're relying on, it will fail. 
there's always some workaround in technology. When it comes to dealing with alcohol and, and drugs, that, that you could try Alcoholics Anonymous and you could try every recovery program that there is, but the reality is this, if all you're relying on is human strategy and human weaponry, eventually it'll get to the place where you just fail again. Why? Our power's not good enough. We can't fight these battles with squirt guns and water balloons. We need something a little bit more explosive. We need something a little bit more like a bazooka. And that's why we need God's power. Because what we're going to notice is when our power always fails in the battle, God's power always prevails in the battle. They're learning this lesson because now Moses is up there and, and Aaron and her, they see this, what's going on. They're looking down off this hill, and as he's got it up, Israel's running them across the field, and when he's got to take a break, Amalek's running them back. They say, we got to do something about this. Aaron, of course, is Moses' brother. He's probably in about his 80s at this point. He's an old man himself. These guys are hikers. <laughs> they make it up that mountain, but then you got her. Her is Caleb's grandson, or Caleb's son, excuse me. Caleb, the one who went in with Joshua to spy out the land, who, who, who was a strong and mighty in the Lord, encouraged the people, no, let's go. We won't lose this. We got God on our side. He had seen this particular event. Caleb's a very godly man. This is his son. At this time, Caleb's about 38 years old, so his son is probably between 16 and 20 years old. You got this picture here? You got Moses, the man of God, up on top of the mountain, straining for strength, the victory of the people is dependent on where that rod is positioned. And he's got a man who's older than him. And he's got a man who's younger than him that are there to help strengthen him when his strength is failing. And I'll just say this, it's encouragement to any spiritual leader. And let me say any spiritual leader in their lives needs somebody who's older than them and needs someone who is younger than them that are there to help support them and strengthen them in the work that God has given them to do. Moses has that in Aaron and her. They take this rock and put it over there to where Moses can sit on it. And then it says they stayed his hands. That means now he's holding it like this. And you got one guy with his shoulder under that arm and one guy with his shoulder under this arm. And he's able to keep that rod up to the going down of the sun. And would you look at Verse 13, it says, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Discomfited? What does that mean? You ever seen a wrestling match, you know, and like, like college wrestling, not WWE and all that junk. Call it real wrestling, not fake wrestling. And these guys, they start and they're grappled up here around the shoulder. Hey, Josiah, come up here real quick. Come help me out. I'm a whoopie boy. <laughs> we like to wrestle some. All right, put your arms on my shoulders. Okay, so this is how they start. You know, they're, they're getting low man wins and they're fighting and they're going back and they're going back and, and it's a wrestling match and then all of a sudden, poof, poof, somebody body slams the other guy. That's what we're talking about that Amalek and, and, and Israel were fighting back and forth and it was a crazy battle. And, and it says that as Moses kept that thing up until the going down of the sun that Joshua, <laughs> boom, bam, suplexed him, body slammed him. Thank you, buddy. You can go and sit down. That was a cool experience. Get to throw my kid around in church. <laughs> no, that's what it means. Think about this battle. Israel prevails, Amalek prevails, Israel prevails, Amalek prevails, and then all of a sudden they're holding the rod up all night long, and Joshua and the people chase them out of there with the edge of the sword. Overthrew them is what it means. That means fa-bam, flipped them upside down, and the rest of them went running. God gave them the victory. It wasn't their weaponry. It wasn't their strategy. It wasn't their wisdom. It wasn't because Joshua was some a great hero in battle. In fact, this is the first time that Joshua is mentioned here in the scripture. 
Why does it all of a sudden mention Joshua out of nowhere? Well, he's the one who's going to take Moses' place. He's going to lead, lead Israel to battle in Canaan. And if you look at the first, book of jo- or first chapter of Joshua, he's a little bit concerned about his leadership. And if he was concerned, do you think Israel was concerned? I mean, Moses just died. The guy with the rod of God, he just died. You know what Moses is doing here by recording this? So I'm the first guy to ever lead you into battle was Joshua. And it wasn't about his military prowess. It was about the power of God that was standing above them. And so God tells Moses, I want you to write this down for a memorial. And I want you to recite it in the ears of Joshua. I want him to remember this battle. I want him to remember that it wasn't his strength. It wasn't his hodgepodge of militia. Don't even know where they got their swords from. I mean, maybe from the Egyptians as it washed up. I mean, there's nothing that tells us about their weaponry and that's intended so that we would know it wasn't them. It was God. But he also wants, wants Moses to write this down so that Israel will know, I'm going to wipe Amalek's remembrance from the face of the earth. Nobody's going to even say their name ever again. And then it says that, that Moses builds this altar. And if you look with me at verse number 17, or verse number 15, excuse me, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. See, Moses got it. The Lord is our flag. The Lord is our rallying point. And this altar would serve as a reminder to Israel that when we unite together, when we unite together under the power of God, there's no enemy that can defeat us. But it also told their other enemies, don't tread on me. (laughs) We have God on our side says he called it Jehovah Nissi because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Boy, what is going on here? I mean, why is God so upset with Amalek? I mean, it says in verse uh, numbers 14 that he's going to utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. He's going to wipe them out completely as a people group. It seems harsh. Why does God have so much anger against Amalek? Well, we've already established this fact that they came up from behind them like a bunch of sissy pansies and took out some women and children and the elderly and weak among them. But that's not really what it's about. I found this interesting. I was looking, okay, God said he was going to do this. Did he really do it? And I just did a search through the whole Bible for Amalek. God tells Saul... I want you to wipe out the Amalekites because I remember what they did all the way back in the wilderness. This is several hundred years later and Saul failed to do it. So God told David, I want you to wipe out the Amalekites because I remember what they did to Israel when you came out of Egypt, how they prayed on the weak. You need to take them out. And David does. But I found that the last mention of the Bible or of the Amalekites in the Bible was during David's time, but it was at the pen of the psalmist Asaph. In Psalm 83, he groups the Amalekites in with the Arab nations, the Ishmaelites and the Hagarenes, as well as the Moabites and the Ammonites and some other nations that surrounded Israel And he said that they were confederate against God. And it says that they conspired to, and I quote, cut off Israel from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. This means the Amalekites conspired with the Arab nations and the other nations surrounding Israel in the region of Syria and the region of Jordan and the region of Saudi Arabia 
conspired with them to commit genocide against the Jews. That's what Psalm 83 tells us. God knows this is a brutal, wicked people who will stop at nothing to wipe out the Jews. Interesting. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But God had a plan of salvation in place. And God was not going to let any nation stop him from fulfilling his promise to bring the Messiah. And just like he knew, if I don't destroy the Egyptian army, they're going to chase Israel and never let them free. He knew if I don't wipe out the Amalekites, they're going to continue to build this conspiracy to wipe out my people. And I love the world too much to let one tribal people destroy my promise of salvation. And he said, I'm going to put out their name from under heaven. And he does. So Moses records this memorial. He builds this altar. He calls it Jehovah Nissi. My rallying point of victory. See, Israel needed to battle under God's power because when their power failed, God's power prevailed. God calls us to fight our spiritual battles. But God's well aware that we will find ourselves and our power failing. And that's why we need his power. He's our banner. He is our rallying point. He is the one under whose power we receive full and complete victory over every battle that we may face in our spiritual lives. See, God has equipped us with some powerful weapons to fight our battles. He has given us his word to combat temptation with truth. He has given us prayer to prevail against our enemy. He has given us the Holy Spirit to convict us and, and to war against our flesh. But let me tell you that the most powerful weapon that he has given to us is our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10 says this, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign to the people. Do you know what an ensign is? A banner. It's the same word, Nissi, a rallying point, a, a banner under which we will have the victory. And it says this, that the root of Jesse shall stand for an ensign to the people. And it says this, to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. <laughs> you know what that means? The root of Jesse is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was born of human flesh and he lived a sinless life. And he said these words, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And he was lifted up on the cross and the cross was much more than a cross. It was an ensign. It was a banner. And there he paid the price for our sin. And on that cross, he freed us from the penalty of sin and he freed us from the power of sin on our lives. That means my friend, you do not have to sin. You do you do not have to get angry. You do not have to lust. You do not have to drink. You do not have to smoke that drug. You don't have to do any of those things. Why? Because Christ is our banner. Because we can battle under the power that he has provided us. The freedom that he has given us through his death on the cross. And so what that means is that he stands as an ensign. He stands as a banner. And we as Gentiles can look to him and we find in him a glorious rest from the battles that we face. See, the reality is this. We have truth because of Jesus Christ and we have prayer because of Jesus Christ and we have the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ. And so the reality is, is that the power that we have has been given to us by our Savior, Jesus Christ. And because of that, the rallying point for battling believers is still today, Jesus, our banner, Jehovah Nissi, the one who fights for us. And so when you face the battles of life, you've got to battle under the power of Jesus Christ. 
When you're facing that conflict at home between you and your spouse, uh, don't try to just do man's way of doing things. Don't get angry. Don't get furious. Don't manipulate and try to twist their arm into getting them to do what you want them to do. No, what you need to do when you're facing that conflict is you need to get on your knees before God and you need to confess your own faults and your own frailties before him and just say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I have, I have done harm to my wife. I've done harm to my husband. I've talked to him very, very disrespectfully and I've demeaned him and I've emasculated him and I've belittled him. And the husband might say, I, I treated her like a child and I, I wielded my authority against her and God, that was wrong. Give me the grace to be able to deal with my marriage the way that Christ would want me to deal with my marriage. And you come before your spouse and you say, honey, I'm sorry, I was so wrong. I was so wrong. Would you please forgive me? I know we've got an enemy that wants to destroy this marriage, but we've got a savior who wants to redeem this marriage. Can we consider what he wants us to do in this situation? And what you've done is you've combated temptation with truth. And you've prayed to one who can make you prevail. And in those specific moments, you yield your life to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And what you're going to find is that you were able to fight that battle, not on your own power, but under God's power. And God's power has prevailed in your marriage. As parents, we can employ these human strategies all that we want to. We could take the kids out of school. We could cut the cord to TV and get rid of every evil influence in our lives. But if that's all we do, it's not going to be enough. As a parent, I've got to get on my knees before God and I need to pray for my kids. I need to pray for their salvation. I need to pray for their friends and their influences in their lives. I need to pray for God's Holy Spirit to work in their hearts and, and to, to give them truth from his word that I've got to spend time with my kids, suplexing them, <laughs> playing around with them, building a relationship with them, but also taking time to teach them spiritual truth. And no matter how rebellious they may be at times, I've got to respond with the love, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And I've got to show them what our father looks like, not what a fallen father looks like. When it comes to and dealing with lust, you can have the software and you can, uh, you can get rid of social media and get rid of your computer or only give your wife your password to where she's got to be there to let you in. You can do that all, all you want, but there's a better power available to you. You've been freed from sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you've got a Bible that's full of truths that you can commit to memory so that in the moment of temptation, the first thing that comes to your mind is that verse that you memorized three days ago. I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. Flee youthful lusts, flee fornication. That through the power of Christ, you can put these things to a stop in your life. Not by yourself. You can't fight the battle on your own. And those are battles God doesn't just automatically fight for you, but they are battles that he fights with you when you utilize the power that he has made available to you. And the same thing is true, whether you're dealing with drugs and alcohol, or if you're dealing with gossip, or if you're dealing with bitterness, or even depression. Man's strategies will only go so far, but when you battle those things with the power that's at your disposal through our banner, Jesus Christ, you can have victory. He's our banner in the battle. See, the reality is this. Without Jesus, you are powerless against the battles you face. But with Jesus your battles are powerless against you. Why? Because his power always prevails. And so as we face these battles on a day-to-day -day basis, let's not charge Gaza with squirt guns and water balloons. No, let's go with the explosive power 
of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died to redeem you and free you from sin, to free you from the power of Satan, to free you even from the power of your flesh. You can be victorious, but only through Christ. Lord, we come to you tonight grateful for our Savior, for what he has done on the cross. He paid the price for our sin. He freed us from our greatest enemies. And he has provided us with power that goes well beyond our own. And I know that your people deal with battles every day because I deal with battles every day. But your word assures us tonight that when we battle under the banner of the cross, victory is certain. And so I ask you to please bless in our response time tonight and help us to apply your word to the specific battle that we struggle with today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.